your will and your way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody says, Amen. You give God all the glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, the message that the Lord has given me today is we can't hide from our choices. You ever have somebody, uh, especially a younger sister or brother, that um, when you do something that you don't want your parents to know about, they always seem to hold that over you. They always say, if you, do, if you don't do this, I'm going to tell mom or dad. But it's the same thing I'm talking about choices. You can't hide from them. Because your choices that we make, it's always optional. You have two choices. God's way or yours, your way. And the thing about it is, as I said earlier, what tells on us is not a little brother or a little sister. It's our decisions. Your decisions bear the fruit of your choices. You'll either have consequences or you'll have rewards. Now, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I didn't do it. Uh, uh, you know, God said to do this, but I did it my own way. Kind of like, you know, um, that old singer that used to say, I did it my way. I forgot what his name was. No, somebody else. The old crooner they called him. Sinatra. Sinatra, thank you. He did it my way. I did it my way. Okay. That's even before your time, sis. All right. But when we, we see these things and under the, understand these things, a lot of times we don't see the repercussions at the moment. But later down the road, they're there. And the thing I want to talk to you about is your personal and my personal daily decisions. And what are you wanting to see at the end of your day? What are you, are you wanting to lay your head down with a sweet sleep? Or are you going to lay your head down and wonder about whether or not you did the right thing or made the right decision or what's going to happen because of this, that, 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 down the line. So I want you to think about it because you see, I've known in my life after a lot of trial and error that when I make a decision real quick or when I operate or make decisions based on my emotions at the moment, there's a lot of repercussions. There's a lot of things that affect me down the road. And something else I want you to hear. As believers, I'm talking to believers. Again, I'm not preaching to the world. I'm preaching to believers. I'm sharing the word of God with believers first to myself and to you. You and I have to understand that your decisions will be seen because they bear fruit. The choices, you may not see it. Another person might not see that the Word of God has given you a choice. But when you make that decision, everybody sees that decision. Because it's a byproduct of the choice you made. And the thing is this, your decision is not all unto you. In other words, it's not just about your little world because it affects everybody else in your circle. Whether it be church, whether it be family, whether it be wherever you work, your decisions have a rippling effect, either for positive or negative. You can get up every morning and look at the sky and say, oh my God, it's gonna rain. Even though the sun's shining, you say, oh, I know it's gonna rain. And you may leave your house with the sun over you, but you're gonna, you're gonna go somewhere else and guess what, it's gonna be raining. Or you can say, oh, I know it's gonna rain, the sun shines all day, but you're always looking for the rain instead of enjoying the sunshine. In other words, you and I can decide whether or not to be filled with joy, sorrow, oppression, weariness. You can. You say, no, Pastor, that's impossible. No, it's not, because I know it for a fact. When I get tired, I have an answer to that. I find a place to rest. Well, Pastor, that's no big revelation. No, it's a fact. When you're tired, you rest. Same thing when you start missing or start making choices in the way that you want and not what God's Word says. And then ask God to bless your choice even though it was a permissive will, not a sovereign will. You and I have to understand that every choice you make has a tail attached to it. Your decision will always tell others the choice that you made as a believer. If you are so tired you can't go, you have to look at the business of your day. Was it your business 
or was it God's direction and guidance? Did you allow the, the day to over, overcome you and oppress you? Did you allow the worries to just trap you and suck the life out of you? Well, the Word of God says, be anxious for nothing. But through prayer and supplication, let your request be known unto the Lord. And He's just going to throw you against the wall, right? What is He going to do, Sister Jack? He's going to give you peace, right? Do you believe that? But isn't there a pre-action before that? In prayer and supplication, let your request be known to the Lord. Be anxious for nothing, right? Yet and today I find the older I get, I've never been prone to anxiety. But the older I get, all of a sudden I start to understand, why am I so anxious? What is it? What is this energy in me that seems to want to bust out? Or when I look at the day that is before me, I say, God, I got to get all this stuff done. And just thinking about all that I need to get done. Yes, makes me tired. I tell my wife all the time, I said, honey, today I got, do, 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 I got all this stuff to do. But before I do that, I have to go take care of the church business and all this stuff. And I said, when I get back, I'm going to do it. By the time I get back, I say, you know, after I take my nap, I'm going to take care of the rest. And then when I take my nap, it's longer than I expected. So then all that I have to do, I said, well, I'm going to do some of it tomorrow. I'll do a little bit today, but I'm going to do some tomorrow. But I've made choices. You see, I've come to realize and believe that everything, no matter what it is, God has given us a free will. That means that you have choices before you every day as believers. And those choices will affect you. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm believing that if, if I don't know if everyone in here is saved, only the Lord knows. But I'm going to tell you this, that there are fruit that follow those who are saved. You know why? Because you don't make fruit happen, they grow in you, just like a fruit tree. You don't make a fruit tree grow fruit. It's natural um, calling, if you will, is to grow fruit. That's the same thing that the Holy Spirit is in us, is to bear fruit, to grow the character of Christ in us. I wanted you to look at your days past, and I want you to see honestly where you are making the wrong choices. Again, I'm not talking about a salvation issue. I'm talking about being blessed and restored. How many of you love to know that God restores the weary soul? Amen. How many of you want to know how to tap into that? Amen. How many of you remember when you knew and you believed and you went after that very truth? No matter what was going on, God always provided a way for you to choose to have rest when you needed to have rest. So what's happened? It's because of us, not God. That's right, choices we make. Stop beating yourself up when you make the wrong choice. And you, what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about choices that, as the Word of God says, it says that when we make the wrong choices, it eventually leads to death. And that's true, destruction. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about the destruction of your dreams or the destruction or the hindrance to your blessings. Because when you make the wrong choices, they hinder your blessing. They hinder your peace. They hinder your rest. They hinder your ability to teach your children right. You say, well, my children do what they want. That's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be that wisdom. They're going to make their own choices, whether they're before you or behind you. The thing is this, they need to also understand for every choice that they make, just like what we make, there is a consequence and a reward. You don't have the right to remove the consequences from them. You can pray that the consequences be laced with mercy more than anything else. But you don't have the right to remove the consequences from your children making wrong decisions. Just like you don't have the right to remove your consequences from your life for making the wrong decisions. The only one that can do that, and I found in my life, the Lord never removes my consequences. Because unfortunately, I've been hard-headed most of my life. 
Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. So it takes the consequences laced with mercy for me to personally understand that God has a path, God has a way for me to walk in. And this is where we are today. We cry out for revival and I tell you, revival will cost you. We like to look at other churches on fire and get all hyped up. But you don't realize the prayer that goes in before that. You don't realize the fasting that goes in before that. You don't realize the tears that go in before that. You don't realize the brokenness that goes in before that. It's not just something that you get hyped up about because you watch it on TV. A lot of people like to watch the media, like to watch the services on TV and say, Wow, I wish I was there. But you have your own church and you don't do that. You want to be there when you can be here. You want to be here and you're there and you're trying to make something. You want to be part of somebody else's flame. It's right here. It's right here. It's right there. It's right there. If you're looking at other services to get hyped up and you say in your heart, well, I wish I could be there. Man, that, that pastor or that uh, whomever is sharing that word name, he's hiding, he's jumping all over the place. Well, I jump all over the place, but only by the Holy Spirit. Today, you are responsible. You are accountable. You know, even the world, when I was in the world lost, when I was in the world running around like some idiot, when I was sinning and, uh, and adultery and drunkenness and drugs and fornication, everything, you know, you know, even then I knew that I would be held accountable. But you see, as a lost man, I was always hoping I'd never get caught. <laughs> but in my life, let me tell you something about me. I always got caught. You know, you know I always got caught. No matter what I did. I mean, I could plan it out real good. Some of the other guys that, and, that I hung with or gals that I hung with, that, man, they, 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 they seemed never to get caught. And if they were, it was no big deal to me. I was destroyed. Not because I was sorry, but because I was caught and people actually saw what a choice I made. I always ask God, I said, why are you so hard on me? Look at my friend over there. They, they, they were with me. They didn't have a, I mean, they were caught, but they said, oh, well, you know, we all do that. We're all human. After all, you know, hey, my, my dad did that when he was young. My mama did that when she was, hey, after all, you know, hey, God knows. He knows. He knows. But I didn't make choices because that's the choices my mother made or my dad made. The choices in my life I made because that's what I wanted to do. I often asked, I remember when Sister Eva was with us, she said, Pastor, where's all the people at? She said, they, they should be here. You remember that? Where were they at? I said, those who need to be here will be here. She said, they all need to be here. <laughs> that's Sister Eva for you. But as I always used to tell her, I said, people don't come to church because they don't want to. That's the bottom line. They make a choice not to come. I see over there sometimes and then things come up. And I'm talking about in general. And it's not to fill up the chairs, guys. It's to be with one another. I mean, everybody's looking for a click. Everybody wants to belong. But we're the body of Christ. There's no one that can help you more than another true, and I say that, true, genuine brother and sister in Christ. Whether it be to hear what you have to say and come together in prayer. Sometimes, man, I say, Lord God, what can I tell the people to touch them? You know what he always tells me? He says, God, like Brother Paul always say, don't worry about the old mule, just load up the cart. And that's what I always do. I load up the car and I let him take it where he wants to go. Today, this is what I want you to hear. I believe it's of the Lord. We can't hide from our choices. 
because they always have a way of telling on us. Always. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, before we get started into the actual message to Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. We know these verses, but let's read them nice and slow and deliberately. For the word of the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. But blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he come. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. In other words, the drought won't harm it. It will still produce, because of where it is, it's in Christ. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. No matter what comes against you and I, when we are in the Lord, when we're making choices that are conducive to bearing fruit and blessings, then even when you're tired, you're rested. Even when you, you feel bad, you're strengthened. Even when, when everything around you is, is chaos, there's a peace, there's a direction, there's a guidance. And it always leads to the Lord, it always leads to the, that well, that living water. Living water is not water that's, that's just stagnant. When you say the living water means living water means life in that water. The word of God is life in every aspect. I don't, and I've never preached salvation for the spirit alone. I speak, uh, preach salvation for the whole man because that's what the word of God said. Everything that he did on that cross was for the whole man. Spirit, soul, and body. But as with the salvation and the redemption and forgiveness of our sins, the removing of our stain by his blood, that's what he did. But the choices are what we do in light of what he did. Those things that he promised, those healings and deliverances and peace and all those things, they come with a price. Wait a minute, don't you mean I have to earn those things? No, you have to live in them. You have to trust the Lord that when you are getting busy, so busy that you become in a circle, or when you get so worn out, you don't keep going and keep pushing. No, you step back and ask the Lord to give you patience. Ask the Lord to give you a fresh breath. Ask the Lord to give you a place where you can find a stopping place. I have a gate I've been fooling with at my house. I talked to Brother Watch about it and Brother Clive about it and uh, Sister Trumpet, she was there too. And they made recommendations, you know, and I told them, and a Brother Kev, I talked to you about it too. And they made recommendations because the, the size gate, the opening was like a 58 inch of the you know, something of that nature. And I was going to make a single door, and it's an interior gate, so it doesn't need to be really sturdy, that sturdy as you do an exterior gate. And three out of the four, maybe uh, maybe all four, I told them I just want to make a single door, and they said, oh no, you don't want to do that because the weight, the size of it in itself would, would pull it down to one corner. And you know, I've been fooling back and forth with that. And it makes sense, right? Brother Jeff, that doesn't make sense. And we know, I've done it many times, that if you come by my house and you see all the fences I have, the gates that were put up before, about 10 years ago, they, they all have that slant. Uh, Brother Kev has strengthened some, reinforced some, it's not as bad. But you know, I took all that into consideration, but I don't want it to be a two week program. I don't want it to be one of these things that take, you know, what I'm saying. I mean, I want, a, I want a quick fix. It's an interior door. And it's so that I can open up that door and cut in the inside with my riding lawnmower so I don't have to push all the time, right? 
So I told him, uh, about, about a week ago or two weeks ago by now, I said, I'm going to well, put that fence. He said, well, you need to call Brother Watch here and Brother Cloud. He told him well, you would. I said, no, he's got to work. Brother Cloud's got things going on. By the time they get here, you know, then it's going to take, we're going to all decide, we're going to measure this and do this and do that. And before, I'm going to be so tired and frustrated with all that, I just soon put it together myself. So I went the other day, and I pulled out my postal digger, that gas postal digger. I said, I'm going to fix that rascal. And don't you know, I looked in there, the, the motor in itself is perfect, hardly no usage. Y'all know y'all used it. But don't you know there's a little tube that goes to the carburetor from the gas tank? Well, that tube had dry rotted or rat chewed through it. So guess what? I can't use it. So you know what I'm left to use, right? Okay. Now you can get the drip. Say what? Do you know what it means? PhD, both hold there all the way, right, brother? And it doesn't come with an automatic power source. It just comes with a determined sweat, right? Okay. So another day, I woke up from my nap, and don't mean to take you on a detour, but I gotta tell you. Woke up from my nap and just been spending all morning going to do all these things that a good pastor is supposed to do concerning the church, church business. I get back and I said, I've, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And then I ate. And I said, oh, I'm too full to do that. So I have to take a nap and let that go down, you know. So I took a nap and I said, I'm going to wake up in 30 minutes. Well, about two hours later, I wake up and I said, wow. What happened here, you know? So anyway, Nell does her, her daily walk. She walks how many miles, honey? Three. Three miles a day. And she was doing that. And I said, well, while she's doing that, I'm going to do that. So she said, are you sure? You I thought you were going to call the brothers. I said, no, I'm going to get it done. And I, in my mind, I said, I'm going to get it done in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so I made the choice of taking care of it myself. At least part of it. And she got back and said, Well, I thought you were going to do the door. I said, Well, I made the frame. That's as far as I got. I made the frame. And then I looked at her and said, Lord God, help me to use wisdom. You know what he told me? He said, Stop. Because I was trying to make it happen in a little time frame. In other words, when you make a choice, Look at the repercussions of that choice. What is it going to involve? Who is it going to involve? How much time are you willing to give that? Now, this is a long story to make a point here. Life is just like that. It's full of choices. Whether it be little choices, big choices. But they all affect your day. Every choice you make. And it also affects people around you. It affects your work, your employee, the employees. So by now, when we look at something like Jeremiah 17, and we start understanding something, God, you say, well, I was trying to do the right thing. But you know what? God says, I know your heart. So you see, you can't even get away with the choices you make under the veil of Christianity because God knows the motive that was behind that choice you made. And that's why it goes to say it like this. The heart is a deceitful, is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And God answers that question. I can't know what's going on in your heart. Yet I can see by product of uh, your choices, because they brought you to make decisions that produce certain outcomes in your life. If you want good, right outcomes, you need to make the right choices. Period. You can't do it halfway. You can't do like what I'm doing with that gate, trying to hang it before it's finished. No. You need to put it all together. You need to, to look at what that, that choice, those choices you make. You're in the day, from the moment you get up, to when you make that decision. Because once that decision is made, it's a done thing. And then you have to try to regain ground with your own choice. Hear what, hear what I'm saying. Choices is what God gives us. Choices between his way and your way. But the decision is not the same as the choices. 
The decision is a byproduct of the choice that you make. It can't lie, it won't lie, and it shows itself to everyone. When you say, well, you know, I, I did this or this, but the outcome shows exactly the choice that was made, the decision that was made because of that choice. It goes on here and says, I, the Lord, search the heart. So he answers that question, this is specifically Louis says, who can know it? He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. In other words, there's consequences or rewards to every choice that you make. Every choice. So by now, in your life, all of you that are old, over the age of accountability, every last one of you, you can relate to me today. When I talk about choices, and I talk about the decisions that we make concerning that the byproduct of your choice is your decision, and the outcome of that decision shows the choice that you make. All of us, whether it be Sister Carrie, whether it be Coco, whether the only one that is not subject to this in here without talking about, it, that's why you should all be able to relate to me, is Lydia and Malachi. Because they're all underage. They're all in the, both of them are in the age of guilt. But every other one of you, every last one of you, are responsible for making the right decision because you've been given a choice either to choose death or life, blessing or cursing. And that's not just in receiving the Lord as Lord and Savior. That's the first step. But after that is where the blessings come in. After that is where the health comes in. After that is where the peace comes in. After that is where the restoration comes in. And the clarity and on down the line. Anyone who has lived long enough in this life is accountable and responsible for every choice, for every decision you make. And like I said, the choices, choices are always there. They're optional. God gives you a choice. But the decision is yours, not his. And because of that, you have consequences or you have rewards. Choose his way, you have rewards. Choose your way, you don't. You may have temporary gratification, but long-lasting peace, no. Long-lasting joy, no. Long-lasting strength, no. Long-lasting health, no. It's like a guy that got a new heart transplant. I told you that before, and I'll say it again, I'm not Repeating myself because I don't remember. I'm repeating it because it's the powerful truth. And the fact that he, God granted him to have a new heart. He was put on the list ahead of everybody else for a heart, a new heart. And boom, he got it. And immediately when, I, when he got it, and I knew the man. He was one of the brothers of the church that I was at. And he got a, a, that heart, I mean, he's overweight, but when he got, they put, he had to get on a diet before he even received that heart. When he got that heart, that transplant, do you know, almost immediately his countenance changed. He had a nice, beautiful color to his skin. He was looking good, had a good attitude, everything was going well. And then he started making some lousy choices. He started eating what he shouldn't eat. He started doing what he shouldn't do. He started going where he shouldn't go. And in a matter of eight months, that that was so beautiful, so happy, was totally destroyed. He died. He was a young man. We cry out, Lord God, if you just see me through this situation or circumstance, I'll do this. I'll make better choices. No, as soon as you get through that, you go back to the same thing that you did before. Unless you realize what it is and stop being a victim. People seem to want to be victims. Well, it's somebody else's fault. It's this. It's that situation. No. What makes a victim a victim is when they have poor choices. Just a believer. When people get hooked on alcohol, is it because they abstain from alcohol? Don't tell me you know everything about alcoholism because I was an alcoholic. I know what that is. 
I know how that came along. I know where it started. Yes, I know generational curses are there, making me, making me more prone to that. But the choice to drink like that was mine. Pornography, you think you're born with that state, oh, I'm gonna watch some pornography? No, you start with one little look at a time and guess what, it doesn't take long for your eyes to stay stuck to that. And even when you realize what's going on, you shut it down and what happens? It stays in your head. It's like a poison. The toxicity of that, or toxicity of that is, is beyond anything you can possibly imagine. I did research on that and it's unbelievable. Because I see many believers that are hooked on that. Many pastors who have fallen because of that. And it starts because you make poor choices. It's important that you understand just because you're a believer doesn't, doesn't remove the accountability and responsibility for you to make the right choices. In fact, it intensifies. Like I said, by now, each and every one of us, in your lives and in mine, or anyone else that's lived long enough knows exactly what I'm talking about. Knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you realize the right and wrong after the choice that you made, which became a decision. I've always made a practice in my own life when I'm moving in a direction. So how many of you know that it's easy to get into a speed mode? Answers, you know, just boom, boom, boom. And making decisions, buh, 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 buh. and I'm, I'm, I'm good at that. And then finally I learned, I said, you know something? This has got to stop. Because I'm always having to catch up ground that I lost because I made rash decisions. Or I let my emotions get ahead of me. Or I did something or said something that actually I promoted the way that I was going to feel uh, two hours later. He said, Pastor, you're telling me. He said, no, I'm speaking to you as people, as believers. Every last one of you. See, our consequences and rewards of our choices become our reality. You can't hide from that. That's why I said we can't hide from our choices. We are constantly faced with ways that seem right and the right way or an okay. But we, we start looking at it more or less as my way syndrome. My way syndrome. I know believers here, they have this concept, and I'm not going to name it, but I'm not looking, I'm going to look up the ceiling, so I'm like this, I'm looking at this. or look at the floor. It's either their way or no way. And God says, I've got news for you, it's my way or no way. We seem to think that our own, you know, this, this is what we all say, right? It's my life. My life. Where did you get that life from? Where did you get the opportunity to live that you can even make a choice? Yeah, it's your life. When it's all said and done, what is that life going to produce? Say, well, it's all about it's all about what I want to do. Well, what about people in your life? What about your friends? What about people you're trying to minister to? Are they seeing you talk a lot, but doing little? Are they seeing your choices very much like their choices, and yet you're spotting off some religious word? Brothers and sisters, you and I need to understand something. Choices is a gift. And that's why you and I are to seek wisdom every day. Now, I know there are many people that say, well, I have a college degree. Whoop-a-doo. Well, I've got all this academia. Great. So I tell you, to he who's been given much, much is required. If you've been given all this to work with, then what are you doing with it? Because even that, if you don't work it, 
If you don't work with it, it will be taken from you. I have a lot of college behind me too, but I have a lot of other stuff too. A lot of natural lifetime experiences that add to my academia, if you will. I have college. I have different schools behind me, but they're all behind me. They don't do me any good if they stay behind me instead of directing me and guiding me. It's the same thing with the Word of God. You can spout all the Word of God you want to me. You can pray all you want in front of me, but if you're not walking in what you're saying, then you're just one of these people that have all this head knowledge, but no direction, no guidance, no stability, no anchor to your life. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Our readings today are in Genesis 3, 1 through 9. Psalms 19, 12 through 14. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. Romans 1, 18 through 23. And I'll be looking at that scripture more Wednesday than today. James 1, 12 through 15. Now, I'm going to paraphrase these things that I've given. You can write them down, but I want you to study them at home. I don't have time because I've taken a lot of time this morning. Genesis 3, 1 through 9 speaks about the serpent. When he approached Adam and Eve, when he approached Eve, he presented to Eve choices. He said, surely God hadn't said this or didn't say that. And she said, yeah, he did. But when she entered into conversation with the serpent, he presented to her something that she wasn't aware of before, a choice. But her choice was based off of her five senses and not off of God's word. And because her choice was based off the five senses, and not God's word. Guess what the decision was? Can I tell you what the decision was? Well, that's I don't really even know. But we are a byproduct. When we before we came to the Lord, we're a byproduct of their decision. We came into this world fallen because of their decision. And because we now have the opportunity, because of what Jesus did, to choose. His way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, the byproduct of that should be the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. Our choices should be steeped in wisdom that comes from on, from on high, not sensual wisdom. Yes, I know. We're only human. Well, you know, all I can say about that is, yes, we are. That's why Jesus is our Savior and we're not His Savior. He is our Savior. He is our all in all. So we know Genesis 3, 1 through 9 was about what the choices that were put before them and what happened. Then we have our text that you can read up there, Proverbs 14, 12. And I'll just hold that there. We have Psalms 19, 12 through 14, which is where David was very concerned about the choices he made. He said, do not let me fall in the sin of presumption. Thinking that the choices he made or the things that he did were okay with God because they had consequences. They knew that. That's why he ended his supplication, sisters. Cindy Lou with this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O oh my God, my strength, my redeemer. Then you have Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I only use one verse there because it speaks volumes. Verse 8. I want you to go there with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Verse 8. When you get there, say amen. The word of God says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. He that did, not the pit that I dig, the pit that I dig, I fall into if I'm not careful. 
You dig your own pit or you make sure that you don't get close to that pit. The word of God says this before I get too far into it. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh a hedge, a servant shall bite him. In other words, he's speaking about responsibility and accountability, right? Is he putting that on my shoulder as your pastor? Who's he putting it on? You. You. In other words, what you sow, you can expect to reap. In other words, what you do, you can expect repercussions or you can expect rewards. It all comes, it comes about to us. You know, choices are, are, are a gift. They're a gift when you make the right choice. And you cannot, and I say that over and over again, you cannot tell God, well, you know, I thought I was making the right choice. As a believer, you know what the right choice is. He says, choose life, not death. Choose blessings, not cursing. He says, all these things are about you. It's about your decisions tell on you. It's a byproduct of those choices. And we know that. When I do, when I... You might say, well, Pastor, this is not under death, but it is under destruction. How many of you lost your peace over some project? Because you didn't think about it. Oh, yeah, we all know that. And that's just a light thing. How about when it comes to different things? Family matters. Husband and wife issues. You know, you, you enter into this these choices. Uh, as an individual, I always told the husbands in here, you are charged with keeping peace in your household. Ah, oh, but no, no, no. You, you want to be the boss man? Then you're charged with keeping peace in your household. And that means that you share the word of God, but you don't share it heavy handed. You share it humbly. You're charged to be the gatekeeper of that household. Now, if you don't have a husband, then the Lord Jesus Christ is your gatekeeper. He gives you the power to do that, and vice versa. But the choice that the husband and wife make, first you have an individual choice, either to submit and surrender to one another. Because, you know, a lot of people say, ah, uh, you know, the wife has got to su submit, uh, you know, and be underneath the husband all the time. You're misreading and understand, misunderstanding the scripture. There is a give and a take. There's respect. And there's respect, there's love, and then there's love. One doesn't hover over the other. There's a choice you make. You choose to love and to respect as your husband chooses to love and respect, as your child chooses to love and respect, because the consequences are yours. You can't take the consequences for your child when they reach that age of accountability. God removed the consequences of our past sins on that cross when we're in Him. But you can't continuously choose to live like you did in the past and expect God to be okay with that. You can't cheat on your income taxes and say, well, God's okay with that because, you know, I don't serve that kingdom. No, but you're an example of how we to serve God in this kingdom. Give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. When somebody does labor for you, you pay them. You don't try to get them to, to give it to you. You pay them for what it's worth. You offer that to them. There was a young girl one time when, when I was doing hair, when I cut her hair, and I told you a story again, but I'll tell you again. She was young, she just come to that age, I believe 13 years old, and she just got those fingernails, you know, when they get you fingernails and all that stuff. And she came in and she wanted me to cut her hair. But she wanted a specific type of haircut. It's called a pro progressive um, bob. Everything moves to the front. Cut up in the back. You know what you wore it before. It's cut up in the back and moves to the front. But she didn't have the hair nor the face for it. And I told her, I said, it will not work for you. But she wanted it anyway. And she had been my client, her whole family had been my client for many years. Since she was a baby. First haircut and all that stuff. And her mother said, Well, if you don't do it, I guess I'll have to find somebody else to do it. And I said, But it's not going to work for her. 
And she said, just do it, Eric, and, and, and make it okay for her. And I said, I can't make it okay for her, but I'll do it. And I told you before, I divided her hair in half, and I cut one half of it off. And she freaked out. What? What, what did you do? I said, you made a decision. It's too late to go back on it. The choice was there. But the decision she made, and it was too late to go back. I couldn't put the hair back on it. You follow what I'm saying? This same little girl. This is what made me get outside of my tent ministry, by the way. I was, I was okay just behind a chair preaching the word of God, being ordained and all that stuff. But I didn't want to get out into the public, in the, in the church setting. Too much responsibility. God had other plans. But the same little girl, her dad called me a week later. And he says, we lost her. I said, what do you mean? We lost her. He said she snuck out of her bedroom at night to go with her boyfriend and went to get a coke and he hit a tree and broke her neck. Boom. Broke my heart. So then I realized that the choice I had made to stay behind the chair was not God's intent. And too many young people dying, too many other people that thought they were in Christ that were not in Christ. And God told me to get out from behind the chair and become a man and get in the center, regardless of what I fight against. The choices in her case were horrific. It affected her family. I don't know what even happened to them afterwards. I know that she was dying of cancer. She had bone cancer and then she had a bone marrow transplant from one of her, her children. I tell you all this stuff, is because every choice has a consequence of reward. You take young people like yourselves in here, you don't think anything about but tomorrow, you really don't. You know, it's today, right now, the moment. I get it, I've been there. I don't know what I'm talking about to you. You say, well, that's just too old. He don't know what he's talking about. But you forget, I was where you were. Every last one of you, I don't think there's anyone in here older than I am today. And so I can faithfully tell you, every last one of you, I've been where you are. I can also tell you that because you're not as old as me, you have not been where I am. The choices that you make have consequences and they have rewards. Romans 1, 18 through 23, I'm gonna leave that for Wednesday night. Uh, I don't want to go into it now because it will take too long. But we will go to James 1. James 1. 12 through 15. The word of God says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. But when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And listen closely. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, not by somebody else, but by your own lust, your own appetites, your own choices that you make. That's what leads you into that area. If it's, a, if it's not of God, it leads you into an area that is all of you. So therefore, you have to maintain it. You have to balance it. Whatever it may be. But God's word is already balanced. God's word is already has, a, has the, the rails, if you will, a protection, a blessing. And he says, don't go this way, because if you go that way, this is what will happen. Don't choose to go that way. Don't partake with those who do evil. Don't uh, have your friends be of a bad uh, uh, conduct, association, the word of God says. But yet we, we, we say, I don't know why I did this. I don't know why. I did. Well, your friends don't make you do it, but they influence you. 
You know, you say, well, but you don't know, Pastor, the situation that I'm in. It doesn't matter the situation you're in. God's word has the answer. And then you can hold God accountable. When you take his word, then you hold him accountable. When you don't take his word, he holds you accountable. The word of God continues to say this. Then when lust hath conceived and bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Much similar to, Brother Jonathan, our text today. And our text is found in Proverbs 14, 12. What of God says in Proverbs 14, go there for me. Proverbs 14, 12 is your text verse. But I want us to read the whole Format that I gave you up there, 12 through 16, I think it is. Yeah. Word of God says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That is your text. Now, you can take that literally, you can take that spiritually, you can take that daily. Because when you don't have, when you don't choose the way that God directs, then what you put your hand to will not flourish, it will flounder. It will cost you more, it will take more out of you more frustration, and you end up losing ground and having to try to gain that ground in order to go forward. And you find yourself in the same place because you had to first gain ground to go forward. So you're all worn out because you're gaining that ground back and you say, well, whew, I, I finally got over that, but you don't realize you're right back in the same place you were and you're gonna have to make the same decision, same choice. Because if you make the same, if the choices are before you that were before you before, and they are and will be again, then what makes the difference is the decision you make concerning the choices. If you make the same one again that you made before, guess what? You'll be in the same place again. Do you not know what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. That doesn't take a a scientist to figure that out, right? You can you can say that in your own life. I know I've been there. So have you. Every last one. Word of God says, even in the laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in his own or in his heart shall be filled with his own ways. Not your husband, not your wife, not your pastor, but your own ways. Because of the decisions you made. Concerning the choices that you need. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. It reminds me of what we we're talking about earlier, Brother Brian. There are a lot of people that submit and surrender to uh, pastors because they have a lot of charisma or a big church or social standings or man, they like the way they look or whatever it may be. And they believe everything they say, but they don't read the word of God for themselves. So they, what they call the simple, believe everything. But the prudent or the wise search out. It's like I told Brother Brian. It's like the Berean that was more noble than all the other Jews. They studied to show what Paul was preaching was right. They wanted to find out for themselves if what he was preaching was right. They were not simple. There's a lot of people today in the churches, and you can see that. There are a lot of predominantly, as I've said before, Protestant churches that are totally heretic, totally, have fallen away from any resemblance of God-fearing at all. How did that happen? Well, look at the choices that they made. The choices has always been before us. You have the culture and their preaching, and you have the Word of God and His preaching. What is, what is profitable and what is not? God's Word. For the man, for the church, for the family, for the husband, the wife, for the children. The word of God says, the simple believeth every word, but the prudent, the wise man looketh well to his going. In other words, you're not going to believe somebody else. You don't believe the word of God. If you're born again, that same spirit in you should come into agreement with the spirit that's in me when I share the word of God with you. I don't have to remove the rough edges for you to eat. You just need to eat when you read it for yourself. Word of God says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. 
I see that more and more often today. Brothers and sisters, again, let me read the text for you. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Amplified says it this way. There is a way which seemeth right to a man, and appears straight before him. But at the end of it, it is the way of death. Our theme is this. Our characters are defined by our daily choices. Our characters are defined by our daily choices. Now your past does not define you, but your daily choices do as a believer. People will know you as a genuine or as a hypocrite. People will know you as a person that uh, you know, they're associated with that says they're a believer, but they're, you have no fruit. So they say you say a lot, but you don't do any. See, they don't see a contrast between you and them. Brothers and sisters, you know, Galatians 6, 7, and 9, or 7 through 9 supports this truth personally. What we sow, we reap. But there's something else I want you to look at, if you will. Look at 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. Peter made an acknowledgement about this as well. 1 Peter chapter 3, 8 through 12. Peter said this, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil. When somebody does something to you, you have a choice, right? You can react to that choice, or you can what? Respond to that choice. You can return evil for evil, and what can you expect? You expect consequences, right? But if you return evil, if you turn, return good for evil, what can you expect? God says that when we please Him, that He makes even our enemy to be at peace with us. And that's what God's Word says. He said, well, I don't see anything. No, you don't have to see it. You just have to know it. But you've got to believe it. Now, the Word of God says this, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. Lord, well, if you react the same way they did, your blessing, you're not going to receive your blessing. Word of God says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. All this is about choices. Your choices, my choices. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Open your Bible also while we're here. Now go to 1 Corinthians instead. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to show you something because I'm running out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says something that a lot of people don't pay attention to anymore. Because they say choices are, are my own. Therefore, just like my life is my own. Have you heard that before? My life belongs to me. I'm going to do what I want. Da, 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 da. I'm talking to the church right now. So when you make choices, are you responsible how it affects others? Yes. yes, you are. Yes, you are. You see, a lot of times, people make choices bank on just them. How does it make me feel? What's it going to do for me? Da, da, da. And it's poor choices at best. But they never consider the effects of their choices to others. Let me tell you what God says. I'm talking about believers, right? We're supposed to know, right? You are accountable, right? I'm responsible, right? We're responsible, right? For our choices. So we have no reason to gripe when our choices produce what we saw. Right? The Word of God says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it says, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. What's he referring to? Those who just started with the Lord, babies in Christ, or somebody that might not have the faith developed as you have right now. See, you have to walk by faith and be led by faith. You're, you cannot have a worldview. You must have a biblical worldview if you're a believer. And that's a choice. 
Far too often, many people in the church, Sister Carrie, don't have a biblical worldview. They choose to have a worldview. And that doesn't work. The Word of God says here, if you drop down to verse 11, because in between it talks about idols. But in verse 11 it says, And through your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren and whom their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So when your decisions affect other brothers and sisters in Christ, the weaker, when you stood and some concerning your faith, and all of a sudden because it's not comfortable or convenient, you take a U-turn. What do you think you're going to do to that brother or sister that's looking for you as God to guide us? You're going to cause them to stumble. I've seen people that first come to the Lord that had an issue with drinking and they were delivered from that. Or an issue with pornography and they were delivered from that. But then they, they, they start hanging with an older brother or sister in Christ whom spots off grace, 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 liberty, liberty, liberty. And they kind of dip in these things. And his brother or sister sees that. And then after a while they say, why should I believe you? Why should I, why should I believe the word of God if, if you talk so much about it and say that you're a believer and that Christ is your all in all, all is your all sufficient? Why should I believe you if you're still playing in, in the world? And you cause that brother or sister to stumble. You make them feel it's okay to live like they, they were living before. After all, they say, well, if it's okay to live like I was living before, what's the use of, of choosing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? What's the use of believing that there's healing? What's the use of believing that there's blessing? We're making the right decision. You see, the accountability and responsibility is not just when you stand before the Lord. The Lord's going to ask, why did you compromise? Why did you do this? Why did you do this and cause this brother or sister that are weaker than you to stumble and perish? Not very much what I call a Mother's Day message, is it? It's not meant to be. It's meant to be the message of God for us at this time. Yeah. I'm talking about making a point to choose the kingdom of God above all else. The word of God says that I'm almost finished. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, Father, the Father knows that we have need of all these things, the things in life. But Jesus well said, he said, seek ye the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and all things should be added to you. Jesus was talking about priorities, as you said. He was talking about priority concerning making decisions. That's what I'm talking about today. What is your priority? And be careful because whatever is the treasure of your heart or people's hearts will dictate their decisions and sooner or later what they're bending to and towards as time goes on will be seen. No matter what. Today I'm going to talk about that priority that Jesus did. Because whatever is our priority today dictates the choices we make for tomorrow. I'm talking about reestablishing that which God calls most important in our lives. I'm talking about returning to our first love with more than lip service. Loving Him with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our strength. Saying yes, Lord, today and not looking back. I'm talking about getting excited again. Staying excited about the things of God. About revival. About the gifts of the Holy Spirit ready to operate in us. I'm talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit that must grow in us because that's how we will be known. And last but not least, I'm talking about the soon and second coming of the Lord Yeshua. Yes, brothers and sisters, God sees and knows our hearts and what's in them. That's why he says, Lord, search my heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing, consequences, rewards. He knows our hearts. And the only way we can be sure that we are where we need to be today is to seek him and his wisdom in a real way. With the intention of doing what his word says, not looking for a loophole. Make the right, right choices now. And if you're unsure, go to the word of God, step back. And seek God's wisdom. Don't do like some of these people do. Throw your Bible up and let it fall on the floor. And wherever it opens up, that's where you look at. 
I heard one, one pastor say that one of his congregational uh, people had a habit of doing that. They throw their Bible up to, to get an answer for their problem. And he threw the Bible up and it fell on the floor and it opened up. If your right arm causes you to stumble, cut it off. That's not wisdom. That's not what he's talking about, is it? But I ask you, you don't have to throw the Bible up and see where it falls. You just have to open up and read it for yourself. As I close today, I'd like to give you something to think about. How many of you have heard me, I'm sure many others say, remember Lot's wife, it's the shortest sermon in the Bible, right? But God showed me something about that. He said, Lot's wife turned back to what she left behind. And I always said it's her children, her nieces and nephews, more so than a possession. But then God showed me in Genesis, <clears throat> Lot made a choice too, Lot made a choice. To begin with, before, before his wife ever did. You see, there came a point in time where God there was having a problem and Abraham said, look, we need to separate because the men are getting feisty and they want this and that. And he said, look, Lot, you look wherever you want to go, I'll take the opposite. Now, Lot chose the glimmer, chose the world, so to speak, chose the city of Sodom and Gomorrah to go to the next day. And Abram chose Canaan, the promised land of God, the promised land of God. Lot entered into Sodom and Gomorrah, made his life there. So now you we look at that where Jesus says, remember Lot's wife? She turned back. But I also ask you, remember what Lot did. He made a bad decision too. He made, to me, the decision to turn and feast his eyes upon Sodom and Gomorrah before his wife ever even thought about turning back. And then when he was delivered out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he wanted again something similar to that. Let her go. In other words, he wanted to have what he wanted to have. Did not Lot spend time with Abram? Was he not blessed because of Abram? Lot wasn't blessed because of him. He was blessed because of Abram. He saw what Abram saw. He heard what Abram heard. And yet he chose the world over and over again. The Word of God says in Proverbs 4, 18 through 23, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. He said, my son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. A wise man feareth it departed from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. That's the text reading that we had in our text. I've heard this saying before, a proverb is a short statement that is drawn from long experiences of life. And it's true. That's exactly what Proverbs is written from. Solomon's experiences in life of making long choices. Daily choices are up to you and I. And as long as we're here, we must learn to always consider the consequences. And always ask yourself, what am I willing to pay to do things my way? Because that's the bottom line, either God's way or our way. And the only way it can be both is when we agree with God's way. As Amos 3, 3 says, can two walk together except to be agreed. Church, the Word of God says without any apology, God is not mocked, but whatever a man soweth, that he shall reap, whether it be to the flesh, for corruption, or for the spirit of eternal life.
But I say that even this pertains to your life right now. The blessings of God are spiritual in nature and they manifest in the physical for us today. You don't need any blessings when you leave here. You don't need any finances when you leave here, do you? Are you going to need houses? You're going to have a, a mansion according to the Word of God. The goal that people die for now are going to be pay or paving the streets. There's no sickness, no tears, no nothing in heaven. So everything that we need is concerning the blessings of for now, of for here. For the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. I'll leave you with this in Psalms 9 as we close. The Word of God says this. The Lord also will be a refuge for their oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know your name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Father God, that's the blessing for this body that I serve today, Lord. For my brothers and sisters, Lord God, let them hear what you have to say through this message, Lord. We can't hide from our choices because our choices produce a decision and our decision always tells what choice we make, no matter what, because it bears a fruit. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you touch each and every heart today, whether they be here or whether they be watching video, Father. Lord, let them hear the message let them see the truth. Let them honor God's word by, Lord, choosing his will, your will, Lord. Lord, in everything, Father God. Lord, there are things, Father God, that only you can see, only you can know. And that's why your word is so precious to each and every one of us. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your mercy, for your goodness, and for your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody says, Amen. Would you give God all the glory? Hallelujah.